thank you for being with us today, Dr. Goldberg, or Mr. Goldberg. Thank you very much for, for having me. I, 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 we're, we're in lockdown, guys, so, so um, I haven't been out for months, so that hence why the hair is um, looking like a mop, and um, it's so nice to see uh, external faces, because we, we literally have been um, locked in. We're just about to open up. Um, but I hear for you guys, it's it's been a, a, perhaps a little um, uh, less locked down, and I hope uh, everyone's safe. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about the subtalar joint. Charlie's done a fantastic introduction. I can stop really at that point because no one understands it. It's an enigma. Um, and I certainly, during my residency, spent a lot of time um, confused and not understanding really how it worked. And, when, when I was first an attending and I, I had to do a subtalar joint, uh, uh, joint fusion, it was the first time I questioned myself as to what, what am I fusing, where am I putting it, and why am I fusing it, and how is the body going to compensate for the fact that I've just stiffened this joint? And, and I think it makes you ask a whole bunch of questions, which hopefully you'll ask me at the end of this topic, because... because um, uh, 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 it, it's, it is one of the, the least understood joints in the body. So, uh, yeah, I'm based in London. Uh, I'm uh, a clinical academic, so I, I run a number of clinical trials. One of them that we're running at the moment is called the TARVA study, T-A-R-V-A, which is total ankle replacement versus ankle fusion. No one's ever done a randomized controlled trial comparing those two treatments, and we've just finished one. And we're about to report on it. So if anyone's interested in the results of that, completely separate from this, I'm not going to talk about it now, um, but just message me afterwards. Um, let's move forward onto this now. So the subtalar joint uh, is um, what, what we kind of in our minds think of as side to side motion. OK, so it's the walking on uneven surfaces and we think of the ankle joint as being a hinge up and down. But in fact, that's not correct because both the ankle joint, in fact, the knee probably as well, the knee, the ankle joint and the subtalar joint, and in fact, the whole 30 bones in the foot um, all work together in unison. And then none, of, none of them work in isolation. I think it's really important when we talk about movements that we talk about which joint we're talking about when we're talking about those motions. And a lot of work really um, going back um, uh, maybe 50 years um, from Inman's group um, suggest did, did a lot of work um, based on cadaveric work and, 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 and um, uh, anthropometric work, looking at how the joint works, where the axis of rotation was. And they described it as this weird axis of rotation that was somewhere declined about 41 degrees in one plane and 23 degrees in the other. And that's kind of for years, that would became the dogma of how the the, um, the joint worked. I, I I've got a simple brain, so I, I tend to think of things simply and try to think of an analogy. And, and I suppose, um, as Charlie pointed out, there there are three facets of the subtalar joint. There are three facets of the subtalar joint. Um, two of them, the anterior and middle, are often joined together. There's one artic one synovial capsule around the anterior middle or a unifacetal one if it's an anterior middle joint. Um, and then the posterior one, which has its own synovial capsule. And the best way to think of it is the hinges of a door. So although they're independent of each other, they can't work without the other. And in fact, if you think of a four hinge door where the ankle is also a hinge and the tailor navicular joint are also hinges, then you'll kind of understand what's going on here is that there are four components that are all responsible for that motion, which is what you see in high arch feet and flat feet. And this is why the textbooks confuse things, because they describe motion as being eversion, abduction and dorsiflexion, but they're not suggesting at what joint or which one that's happening at. And, and so that motion is actually a composite motion of ankle and subtalar joint. It's not just subtalar joint. But if you're ever assessing someone's sub um, ankle motion, so for example, a silver skills test, so looking at the Achilles tendon, and you ask someone to straighten their knee, put their foot and their heel flat to the floor, and then bring their bum forward, so you're effectively flexing at your ankle, and you're dorsiflexing um, at the ankle joint, um, what you're testing there is not ankle dorsiflexion, you're testing foot to tibia motion, 
Okay, and a large proportion of that is happening at the subtalar joint and at the midfoot. And hence, looking at sort of at a lunge test to look at ankle dorsiflexion is useless in people with flat feet because all the motion is happening not at the ankle joint. And the only way you'll ever be able to sort of control for that would be to supinate the foot. So put, say, a one inch book under the big toe, so under the ball of the big toe, the little toe is off the foot, off the floor, Oh, sorry, it's on the floor. So your big toes on the book, your little toes on the floor and your heels on the ground. And what you then do is you correct any hind foot valgus and you control the, the hind foot locks. And so now any forward motion, um, like a lunge test, would be only testing ankle motion. And what you'll find in people with flat feet, if you do that, they have almost no ankle dorsiflexion or foot to tibia dorsiflexion because all of their motion in people with flat feet is happening at joints that are not the ankle joint. Um, we've published something on that, I think in the JBJS, um, uh, it was called the ADI test or the ankle dorsiflexion index. Um, and it refers to the um, incidence of gastrox tightness in the population, if anyone's particularly interested in that. But um, I digress, because that, that was really just to explain that those motions that you're seeing there are composite motions. It gets even worse when you get the textbooks out and they start showing you these sort of mitre joints to show how a vertical load is transmitted through um, this sort of series of hinges into a, a, a transverse load. And, and um, th th this is, for me, far too complicated. Realistically, all that happens at the subtalar joint is rotation. So there's the calcaneum and the talus rotates either internally or externally, that's internal, which we call eversion, eversion at the subtalar joint. The anterior part of the uh, talus comes forward and abuts onto the where the angle of Gisane is on the calcaneum. And that's inversion, eversion, inversion, eversion, inversion. And eversion is a flat foot, inversion, a high arch foot. That's a cavus foot. And there's a big gap in the sinus tarsi. And that's the logic behind how arthroresis implants work. They control for that, they check that excessive eversion that's happening at the subtalar joint. And weirdly enough, when you look at the other side, uh, and there's the tibia sitting on it, what you see is that the gap reverses. So um, in eversion or flat foot, the gap behind the middle facet increases. And in a high arch foot, the gap closes. That's a flat foot, it increases and behind the middle facet increases in a flat foot and decreases in a cavus foot. And this is a cadaveric um, study where you can see the rotation that's happening. And that's me as the body moving because the foot is fixed, but the reverse happens obviously if the body is, is not fixed. Now, loads of people have tried and attempted to understand um, the subtalar joint and there's been lots of work looking at the instantaneous helical access both of the ankle and the subtalar joint using MRI studies um, and a nice paper that had come out of um, uh, Sheehan's group um, wanted to look at the instantaneous helical access of both those um, joints. I won't bore you with the, the, the science behind it but in essence what um, they were able to show in their study was that they, they could calculate the axis of the ankle joint but they, they could not model the subtalar joint. It didn't seem to, 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 to work. And in, a, in addition, it was non-loaded, and that was a different scenario than it is in the loaded situation. But we know that the axis is roughly in that plane, and it's sort of going from top medial to bottom lateral, but, but um, where is the center of rotation? So we set out to do a study to try and answer that, and... and um, I collaborated with some brilliant colleagues, including Gordon Blunn, who's a, um, a, a biomechanics expert, and uh, Gianluca Tozzi from the University of uh, Portsmouth. And, and we put together a, a program using a PEDCAT. So this is a standing CT. Um, and uh, we got ethical approval to, to, to uh, scan eight patients, um, about 16 feet, in three positions. So we had that to the power of three in terms of the number of um, data sets. Um, and they were, uh, well, I'll show you the positions now so you can see. So we, we, we created these jigs where um, people would be able to, to, to stand on. This is, in fact, Gordon Blunt's feet. So you can see one foot is very flat and one foot is very high arched. Okay. And what would happen is you'd stand on these cones 
until your heel stayed on the floor until you felt really uncomfortable, like your um, joint was almost dislocating. And that was what we felt was the extremes of motion. And then the, patient, the, the subject would then turn around and do the same on the other leg. And then a third scan where they were both neutral. And so we had three scans per um, 16. Um, then what you would do is you'd segment and you take out the images to um, segment them. I should play that. Okay, so um, you can identify the bones and, and, and um, segment that not in a typical software. Um, you then rigidly register them. So you identify some landmarks that change. And what you can see here is the blue position is the neutral position. In an inversion, the gap opens. Remember, that's the sinus tarsi. Um, and in E version, it closes down. And in this subject, the flat foot position was closer to the neutral position. In other words, they had a flatter foot. And no one had very flat feet. So there's no pathological flat feet. But in this subject, that there was a closer position to a flat foot than a high arch position. Um, then created a reference system so we could enter, identify the, the, the center of the mass of each of the objects. And then there's two ways of then analyzing when you've got these 3D data. Um, one of them is um, the, the old method, if you like, which is where you take 3D bone reconstructions and then you identify where those points relate to each other. But if both bones are moving, then there's a degree of inaccuracy in both the bones because both are moving. And digital volume correlation is a slightly different technique where you fix one of the bones, you assume that it doesn't move, and then you're looking at the motion of the other bones relative to the fixed bone. And so that was the technique that we used um, uh, in this study. Well, in fact, we used both techniques. Um, and what you're looking for is displacement from that fixed position. So assuming the calcaneum is fixed, then as the bone goes into inversion, the bones go quite, a, the red areas move quite a significant distance away. And when they come back towards blue, then they're not moving at all. And what we uh, then looked at was the center of rotation. I haven't put the slide on here, but we looked at two spherical axes and where they, when you've got a funny shaped bone, you put two spheres that fit into both. And it's the cross section of where those two meet that would become the center of rotation. And that's previous work that had been validated. So when we used the 3D bone reconstruction, we found consistently there was somewhere around the middle for set, but with a lot of variance. And when we used the DVC, it was much more robust data because there was less movement and artifact. So um, in fact, we found constantly that the center of rotation appeared to be around the middle for set, which was what we anticipate, what we expected from the cadaveric work that we were doing. And that work, if you want to read it, is uh, there's the reference there. So it's in the, um, the, the, the links up the top there. So that's been published now with a um, terrible amount of peer review that, that was quite, quite daunting, really. Um, uh, but what we concluded was that there seems to be a center of rotation. It seems to be centered around the middle facet. There was some slight translation, maybe about eight to nine percent. And we figured that that was relating to the viscoelasticity of the soft tissues. Um, because obviously there's a soft tissue component to this joint. Uh, it's a highly important component, which takes us, I suppose, neatly to the next area, which is this whole concept or notion of ankle and subtalar instability. And people have been talking about this for years, but no one really understands it. And the notion of um, ankle and subtalar instability is, is really ill-defined. The patients that present with, I would call, subtalar instability have very, very vague symptoms, okay? So typically, they you can't clinically distinguish between ankle and subtalar clinically. And although you think you can, you will more than not be proven wrong, okay? So it's almost impossible clinically to distinguish between the two. Um, the patients complain that their ankle just doesn't feel right, okay? It just... It's not that it gives way necessarily, it just doesn't feel right. Um, almost always they'll describe that walking along the straight line is fine, but if they thrust, twist, turn, or walk on an uneven surface or up a hill or down a hill, then they're, they're, then they're not happy. Um, a lot of patients complain that it's uncomfortable at night and they, they almost want to pull their foot backwards because it goes almost 100 degrees plantar flexed like, um, like a ballet dancer. Um, and often it clicks because something catches on the side of the ankle, just blow the fibula. And, and what we're looking at are these ligaments that are stabilizing the ankle. And we all know the anterior talofibular ligament. So that's the classic one that people 
describe when people sprain their ankles. And then you've got the calcaneofibular ligament, which goes posterior to anterior. And there's actually a co-joint attachment to where the ATFL. I think the textbooks are wrong, or certainly the texts are wrong when they say that it attaches to the tip of the fibula. That's incorrect. It attaches at the same place as the ATFL, just on the outer aspect of the um, fibula, almost consistently. And the reason that I think people think that it attaches to the tip is that more often than not, when someone sprain their ankle, and who in this room hasn't sprained their ankle at some point, it evolves as a sleeve from the co-joint attachment and attaches just a few mils distal. Okay, and often people then think it attaches to the tip of the fibula, but it, it doesn't. It attaches, as you can see there. Um, so Charlie pointed out a very um, key point there, which is, you know, the complexity of this joint. You've got um, the posterior, middle and anterior. And as I said, often the anterior and middle are, are um, unifacetal. Um, you've got two separate synovial joints. You've got a meniscus, okay? And this is not like the meniscus in the knee. It's, it, it, it's, a, it's a support structure meniscus that sits between the navicular and the, uh, the sustentaculum on the calcaneum. And that's called the spring ligament for a reason that it's not really a spring. It just springs up and holds up the head of the talus. And in fact, if you cut one open and have a look at it, it looks exactly like a meniscus. It's chondral. It looks like a joint surface. Um, and in fact, I don't think that people that describe spring ligament attenuation are describing what I think there is. I, I think that what you have there is an avulsion of the spring ligament, which is a meniscus, a chondrid, a, a, a cartilaginous structure that evolves from its origin, whether it's on the sustentaculum or on the navicular. And then you get capsular tissue that's thin and strained then so half of it is a meniscus and half of it is a sort of effectively a fibrocartilaginous um, capsule. Um, and that's what people call an attenuated spring ligament. Um, but that structure there really is a really important structure. You've got ligaments on the central part, the intrinsics, the interosseous. OK, that's the talocalcaneal ligaments and they're big, thick, strong structures, probably replicating something like the ACL and PCL and the cervical, et cetera. You've also then got the extrinsic ones, which is the lateral collaterals or the medial collaterals in the knee. So that's your uh, calcaneofibular ligament I just told you about, and the superficial deltoid or the tibiocalcaneal ligament. And they are actually on the, on the side. And I suppose the best way to think about it is, is a knee, because that's quite a nice analogy. Um, and then think of it as a medial pivot knee. Okay, so you've got an ACL and a PCL, that's your inter intrinsics and then you've got medial and lateral collateral the the calcaneofibular ligament and the medial collateral which is the superficial deltoid and that's the best way to think about it except it's not just a medial pivot it's completely a medial pivot um uh, uh knee which the knee has has a lot more range of motion that's all that's happening at the subtalar joint in in normal situations and that's different for um flat feet which we'll come to on in a second now I understood there were some non-medics um, uh, researchers in the room. I'm going to show lots of cadaveric stuff now. I already showed you one. I should have put this text before. If anyone is um, uh, queasy and doesn't want to see surgical images, you've got the opportunity of turning away now. So this is a cadaveric dissection. So what you're looking at there is um, the fibula. And there's the co-joint, as I said to you before, the attachment of the calcaneofibular ligament, a big, strong structure that's coming up from the calcaneum here up to the lateral side of the fibula. This is the front of the fibula and the ATFL comes off, not at the front of the fibula, which we think it comes off about a centimeter or more um, lateral to it or, 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 or more or um, on the outer aspect. So it's, it's, this is the co-joint attachment where my mouse is. And um, the ATFL and the CFL, there's the perineal tendons under my retractor there and um, and that's obviously the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. And when those two ligaments are intact, it's really very difficult to open up that joint. Um, when most of the in, the papers that talk about incidence of subtalar joint are, are based on image intensifier studies. So they're going back almost to the 60s. So, um, you know, it's very difficult to understand how, how people have understood subtalar um, instability till now. 
And one of the problems is that if you ever pick up an MRI scan of an ankle sprain, you'll see something like this, where they'll talk about the ATFL. Some of them will talk about the CFL, calcaneal fibula ligament. Some will even talk about the syndesmosis. I, I think you'll, you'll find it hard pressed to find the radiologist that's interested in the subtalar ligaments. And that's largely part of the problem. Um, a lot of the cadaveric work that's been done, and there's many studies now that have done it, that have either fixed the foot or they've fixed the, um, the tibia, um, have tried to, 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 to then do in, in vitro uh, measurements. There's challenges, though, with in vitro studies. You're making assumptions for load. OK, and um, I can tell you, I don't, I, there's not many people in this world that have sprained their ankle horizontal. OK, when you're non-loaded, I suppose if someone kicks a, a, a football or kicks a, a weight at your foot when you're sitting on a chair or when you're foot in the, the midair, then you could um, injure them non-weight bearing. But most injuries happen when your foot's plantar flexed on the floor and you're in fact subtalar joint is locked. So load assumptions are really important because that replicates what happens in real life. They also section the ligaments and the question is that they section them in different sequences. Almost always they section the ATFL, then they section the CFL, then they section the PTFL. So, you know, that's not necessarily what happens in real life. As I said before, they often sleeve evulsion of both of them at the same time. And this is what happens if you section. So we've sectioned both the ATFL and the CFL here, and you can see now the ankle and subtalar joint open up. You will never see the subtalar joint open up like that in real life, unless the ligaments, both ATFL and CFL have gone, because that joint doesn't open up. All it does is it rotates like a medial pivot hinge. And this is when you take a patient to theater and you do an examination of anesthetic, you would see um, the talus grossly unstable. And that is ATFL and CFL that have gone. That's that patient I just showed you now. So that's what happens. But often you take the patient to theater and you do an examination of anesthetic, and you don't see that motion. You see this. And you go, well, what am I going to do now? The patient's on the table. I'm meant to be doing a ligament reconstruction, but their ankle is stable as houses. It's not going anywhere. Um, and there's a reason for that is that that is not a normal um, image, what you're seeing there. OK. And the reason it's not normal is that what, what you're seeing is excessive inversion and eversion at the subtalar joint. In other words, in a transverse, almost transverse plane uh, on a on a two-dimensional view looking from the front, from the coronal plane. And so that is subtalar instability. And there's about 50 degrees of excess motion there between inversion and eversion. Um, and um, when you do it from the lateral side, you'll see this is internal rotation. So what's happening is it appears that the talus is drifting forwards on the, um, cal uh, uh, on the tibia, okay? And in fact, it's not drifting forwards, it's internally rotating. And so as it internally rotates, it appears to look like it's drifting forwards, but it's not. So when we see a um, patient with ankle arthritis where the talus is sitting forwards like that, usually, and I say that usually because there are exceptions when the posterior capsule is completely gone, but usually that is internal rotation. It's the lateral ligaments that have gone and not just an anterior translation. You can see there that the, the symmetric, symmetricity, if you like, of the front of the um, view. And then as you internally rotate, the back opens up. Now, this is a, a patient. I've, I've got to apologize because my cameraman was drunk. In fact, this is one of the nurses in theatre. So it, I, I'm not sure why, but he went upside down. And I've got to show it to you upside down. Um, uh, the, the body's now down south, the foot's north. That's the talus you're looking at. And you can see the subtalar joint and the ankle joint moving together. All the ligaments have gone here. The ATFL has gone. The CFL is that big, thick, bubbly structure underneath that's evolved from the calcaneum, that structure there. Uh, the PITFL is stuck onto that as well. This is gross instability, okay? And what's interesting, and this is why I said to you, you can't tell clinically if it's ankle or subtalar, because look, even open, you can't tell which one's moving there. OK, we'll do it again. Unfortunately, we're going to go upside down in a minute. So I apologize if anyone feels. But there's the subtalar joint. And then as I'm inverting and everting, you can see both the ankle and subtalar joint going. So the patients can't discern it. And we certainly clinically can't discern whether that motion is happening at the ankle or the subtalar joint. That's the CFL that's evolved from the 
calcaneum and just sort of sitting um, on the capsule in, 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 in uh, lax as anything. And this patient was the one that I showed you the images of before, um, as you can see how grossly unstable it is. Now, the notion of peritale instability um, has been around for a number of years, but the description of peritale, I, I think, is first described really by um, Hinterman's group when they were looking at why people got varus and valgus ankles. And um, so peritale instability was looked at mainly in ankle OA, and you can see here that it's not just the ankle, but it's also the subtalar joint that's responsible for that peritale instability. Um, that's moved on quite a bit now, and this is work that's come out of um, uh, the lab from, uh, uh, as you know, in, in, in Iowa, where um, uh, Curvebeam have put in a, a, a standing CT scanner, and um, Cesar uh, Neto has, has got a fantastic lab there doing some amazing work. And, and here's a study that he's um, published recently, which looks at coverage maps in peritale instability. Okay, so we now call it, instead of calling it adult acquired flat foot or flat foot, we're calling it now the progressive collapsing foot deformity because it is a progressive uh, unstable equilibrium. I think the best way to think of it is a bicycle going around um, the bend on a, a track. And at some point you go past the point of no return and you're unstable. And that's what happens in peritalo instability. And what they've now looked at is using the same technique that we used in the nature paper was is to look at distance mapping and also to look at soft tissue coverage okay and um, what was interesting is that, that they've shown that the joints are no longer congruent in a progressively collapsing foot deformity and it seems that the contact area which you would expect in the top left here where all the joints are in the right place which is what i showed you my images of before in gross instability and severe flat feet are no longer intact and there's only about um uh, a 25 percent coverage of those joints in other words there's subluxation of all the joints and i suppose you see it in the thumb in one or two planes but this is it in now in in all um planes um and uh, it, it, it is probably the most uh researched area now in foot and ankle um if not in orthopedics um is to better understand the subtalar joint and the flat foot deformity um, and what you can see here is that in, in a flat foot, what seems to happen is that the front part of the talus, as I described, hits across the calcaneum. And now the new pivot point moves. And instead of being the pivot around the medial facet, the pivot now happens at the lateral facet as it hits the angle of Gisane. And then what happens is as it hits here, it pivots and the tailor head falls off from the calcaneum and falls down this hole indicated by the pink mark, onto what's there, the spring ligament. Now, at some stage, the spring ligament goes. It evolves from the bone. You can have two schools of thought. I told you my view is I don't think it attenuates. I think it evolves off and then the whole structure then strength, uh, lengthens out. Um, but the other school of thought is that it attenuates and thins out um, and becomes a capsule that's sitting here and stretches out between the two structures here. And the tailor head then falls off into that gap. So this is a completely different pathology than I showed you before. So in instability, what happens is the front of the talus hits to the an angle of Gisane and the tailor head falls off the front. And that's why you get this poor coverage of the joint surfaces and peritalar instability. Looking at it from above, you can see here the same view as it goes off. And often the tailor head then gets uncovered by the navicular as well. And so we're now in our lab, we're doing um, some clever stuff where we're looking at the positions and how they move relative to each other. So this is a everted position. This is the same stuff that we, I showed you before in the, in the nature paper. But this is now looking at it from a different plane. And what you're seeing is that in an everted position, the calcaneum, in fact, moves outwards and outwards and, and looks the way it does. And then in, in inversion, it moves inwards and, un, and cups under the, the tailor head. And that um, process um, is what's happening repeatedly in these collapsing foot deformities. And then also the ligaments move and change. So here's an example of 
the calcaneofibular ligament, which should go from the calcaneum up to the fibula, in other words, where my arrow is here, and it's evulsed off and it's stuck onto the talus. And that's um, classic in subtalar instabilities where the calcaneofibular ligament is now acting as an inverter rather than as a supporter of subtalar stability. Sometimes the CFL pulls off and it sits outside of the perineal tendons. And we've just writing in our case report on this as to, to describe it as uh, the equivalent of a stena lesion in the thumb. OK, so that's your calcaneal fibula ligament that's come out from the perineal tendons. It's got to go back inside. There's it putting it back in deep to them to attach to the calcaneum. But in this case, it's obviously it's flipped out and that's never going to heal because that is just like a stena lesion is in the thumb. Um, the adductor tendon is in the way. In, in our case, the perineal tendons are in the way. And when you go to the reports, no matter how many radiologists you show this report to, they'll all describe it as being just a, you know, a usual ATFL a bit thickened. Um, no one described it as sitting superficial to the perineal tendons. And when we went back and looked at it, we could actually identify that exact view we could see. But in other words, it had seen us, but we had not seen it. Now, here's another notion that's going to throw your mind, which is that perineal tendon pathology, we sort of think they're pathologies of their own. I don't think they exist because, look, when your dynamic stabilizers have gone, the only thing that's helping you is your, sorry, when your static stabilizers have gone, so that means your CFL, ATFL, then your dynamic stabilizers are the only thing that's holding you up. And look at them, those perineal tendons are really unhappy because they're basically the only thing that's holding you up on the outside. And they get shredded as they go round the back of the fibula. And so I think perineal tendon tears and perineal tendinopathy perhaps is actually reflective of some chronic instability rather than um, injury per se. Um, and that's a point for uh, controversy and for debate. Um, there's a reason, though, for that madness. So now I put this... Um, nanoscope which is a 1.9 millimeter scope it's really nice if you want to scope wrists or tendons so here's an example of doing a, um, a tendinoscopy whilst i'm doing lateral ligament repair and you can see beautifully into the tendons um, using this scope and so this is now a routine part of um, my management of ankle ligaments and you can see here there's the perineus brevis on the right the sheath and then there's the longus on the left and you can see the tendons a bit tendinopathic it's a bit unhappy Generally intact, though, no tears. Remember, the brevis is folded. It's flattened tendon that's folded in half. So often it looks as a tear on scans when it isn't. There's the fibula sitting here north of us. That's the fibula. It's a smooth surface. And as the tendon goes around it, it gets shredded. And often you see there the fibrillation of the tendon. Um, that's the capsula fold above us. There's the perineus brevis, longus deep to me. OK, and there's no tears there. And it gives you a beautiful view of the tendons all the way up to the muscular tendinous junction. And often if you see a low lying muscle belly, you see it coming down onto you um, just about the level of the fibula. It's a really beautiful view. So um, what have we learned? Right. So in summary, we know the subtalar joint is complex. We know it's got uh, two synovial joints. We know it's got three facets. Sometimes it's two, but we've got three. Sometimes it's even one. Um, that is responsible for um, coupled with the ankle of, of positioning your foot on the floor, that it's almost impossible to discern ankle and subtalar motion between the two, that both joints can become unstable. And when they're stable, the center of rotation is probably around the middle facet, medially, posterior medially. When the joint's unstable, so in other words, when you have ligamentous avulsion or injury, then you get this peritale instability and then the center of rotation shifts, the tailor pivots on the calcaneum and the tailor head falls off and that creates an unstable progressive flat foot deformity. Um, I'll stop now to take questions. I, I'm very happy at any point for anyone to send me an email. Um, I've got, a, I don't know, all this social media stuff now. Look, um, you can Twitter, I'm too old for all this, but anyway, you can tweet you can uh, follow, you can um, Instagram, LinkedIn me, whatever you want, um, and I'll respond 24-7. Um, uh, love to hear if you. If anyone wants to come and visit us, we'd love to have you, and I'd uh, love to take your questions.
Thank you. Really wonderful talk. I see Dr. Beals was on the audience. If he's still on, I know he has to go to the OR. He may have a first question. Or maybe not. Let me ask you about subtalar arthroresis. What are the indications in your mind for an arthroresis plug? So I think, I think most people um, qualify, become an attending and go, they reinvent the arthroresis. They go, oh my God, this is amazing. This is, this is the, the problem. It's because of excessive eversion. We need to stick a plug in there. And I think a lot of podiatrists go through that mind process. A lot of orthopedic surgeons go through that mind process. And I went through it. And I remember having a chat with some um, uh, very senior orthopedic surgeon, all who looked at me in disdain when I sort of mentioned the notion of arthroresis. Um, and I learned, I guess, the hard way that it works sometimes amazingly and sometimes it doesn't work at all. And sometimes you get even more complications from having used it, namely in people with osteoporosis. The bones are so soft that a hard metal effectively bullet that's sitting in the sinus tarsi, which is there, um, crushes down the full body weight goes on it and it just crushes and you get a sort of a uh, either arthritis or, or, or a fracture there so um my my i think if i could summarize my thinking on it is that in a joint that has normal biomechanics i.e um the ligaments haven't gone and and the ligaments um are just lax so there's just excessive motion but normal motion but excessive motion so that is classically your children with flat feet. I think it works amazingly because it basically stops and checks the excessive motion. It allows the patient to stretch up their Achilles, which is the same analogy of me putting a book under the first ray to, to supinate the foot because it checks that correct. And then they stretch their Achilles, which they've been trying for years to do and they haven't succeeded because all they've done is stretch their show part joints. That was all the motions been happening here rather than at the ankle. Um, and so in kids, I think it's got huge utility. So if I saw a seven to 10 year old um, with flat feet that's symptomatic, all I do is an arthroresis and they do amazingly. Uh, but I tell them that it's part of a physical therapy rehab program. They have to learn to mobilize the midfoot. So someone, a good physical therapist, has to hold the hind foot, control it, and then really manipulate the midfoot because there's a lot of scar tissue that's formed there and becomes stiff. So when you put it in at the beginning, that some of them supinate. Um, but you don't need to do anything about that. You don't need to do any correction. You just mobilize the midfoot, controlling for the hind foot, and you've got to stretch up your gastrocilius, ma mainly gastrox, actually, so it's with the knee straight. Um, and if you do that with a physical therapist and the patient's... Um, uh, uh, aware of what they need to do and part of the program, they just do amazing. Now, I've had some kids that have just basically grown up into adults and are normal now. That's a very different story, I think, than an adult flat foot where it's too late. You know, basically the midfoot is as stiff as houses. It's now fixed in supination so uh, or pronation, so it's now collapsed down. Um, you've got um, uh, everything stiff. The, the Achilles is grossly stiff. Um, and uh, I think the arthroresis in that situation can be used as an adjunct. So you have to still do other things, but then arthroresis sometimes is one of my tools in an armamentarium where, where you usually do four, five, sometimes six procedures in one to get their foot flat to the floor. Um, and so I do use the arthroresis as an adult. I don't use it alone though, because it just doesn't work. Does, is that sorry, a long-winded answer, but I think that's my view on it. It's quite nuanced. And and tell me about your approach to the progressive flat foot. And the reason I ask it is it's confusing for everyone. Most of us do something with a gastroc or the tendon Achilles. Since 1880, People have been doing medial calcaneal slides. 1960s, Dylan Evans came out with his opening wedge. 
1930s cotton came out with his operation and then there's been a lot of other operations in between there is interest in repairing the spring ligament but it's inconsistently done so how do you approach it early middle and late so um i think there are there are different types of flat foot as as you know i think um uh, the consensus, there's been a recent consensus discussion. I think it's quite complicated, but a, a recent sort of consensus, um, I would agree with that this is not a TIB post failure. I think we were brought up, and perhaps for the last 20 years, we've been brought up on the Johnson and Strom no, notation that, that, that this is all failure of the TIB post, which it isn't. So I think you do get TIB post failure secondary to the flat foot. So you get secondary TIB post failure. Um, very, very rarely, maybe 1%, you'll see an acute TIB post failure. So, so I think in the main, uh, this is a, a flat foot progressive deformity. So um, I, I suppose the, 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 the calcaneal slide and the Evans logic, I think are achieving the same thing, which is changing the relationship between the front of the foot and the back of the foot. Okay, so both a lateral column lengthening and a heel shift are achieving something by simply putting the back of the calcaneum more medial than the front of the calcaneum. And, um, and uh, so, so I don't do both of those together. So I will do either a lateral column lengthening or a heel shift. And about, I think Evan's paper, it's a really good read and I recommend people read it because he describes the calcaneum as being short as the logic for why he does a lateral column lengthening. But I promise you, you can scan as many calcaneas as you like in adults and they're not short. They're exactly the same size as everyone else's calcaneum. So, you know, I think he was doing it for a different reason, but I think he's got some, he's picked on something, which is that, that it works because it just like a heel shift changes the relationship of the, weight bearing axis of the calcaneum whether you push it at the front or the back you in fact get perhaps a better correction with the lateral column lengthening because there's a longer lever arm so i i personally will will do one of them but not both i know people that do both i don't do that um and also my other bit that I, i've got beer in my bonnet is i don't think you know i've seen people cut through the spring ligament and then you look at it and then they stitch effectively a meniscus, which is an avascular structure. It's cartilaginous. Um, we know cartilage is avascular, neural, and, and um, so, so it doesn't heal. And so I don't think spring ligaments with stitches through them heal. So I don't cut through the spring ligament. I think it evulses from either the navicular or from the um, sustentaculum. So uh, I, I would effectively try and identify where it's gone, the cartilaginous part, and then try and reef it back, and I usually reinforce it. So I, I, I do do a spring ligament repair, but I don't cut through a cartilaginous spring ligament anymore. Um, and I, I do a, a multitude, actually. So, so I'll always do something to lengthen the gastroc. Um, I would do probably a lateral column lengthening. Um, uh, my big concern with lateral column lengthening is that you cut through the middle facet. And that's my biggest concern and has always been that you're effectively potentially creating arthritis for a patient in 10, 20 years from now because you cut through an articular surface. So I, I, I've got a, my own technique of doing that now to try and avoid um, cutting through the middle facet. Um, Hinterman came up with a concept of doing the Hinterman osteotomy where he, he didn't go through the middle facet. He went between the middle and posterior facet. Um, but I, I don't think that gives you as good a correction. I've tried that and I don't think that gives you a good, so I don't do that Hinterman's approach at all. I, I don't understand the logic of it, I, but it, I do think it does protect from pathology that iatrogenic damage. Um, and, I, and I will do, and then I'll look at the first ray and if, if the first ray is, is lifted off and the foot supinated, then I'll do something to address that, which is usually a medial opening wedge or medial, uh, an inferior closing wedge osteotomy on the medial side. And just sometimes in patients that have got really fixed subluxing first TMTJs, I'll do a lapidus, but close it down and, and fuse the lapidus stable um, uh, rather than doing a cotton. So, um, yeah, I'm, I, I think I probably do the same as everyone else, but um, 
uh, with, a, with a few nuances. So, so um, gastroc, um, something to alter the weight bearing load of the calcanium, which is, which is, is usually a lateral column lengthening now, although I was a big advocate against it in the past. Um, and then something on the medial side. And I only do deal with the tib post if it's grossly tendinopathic. So if, you know, there's a real source of pain, I'll take it off and shift and do an FDL transfer. If it's not a source of pain, I'll leave the tib post. Sometimes if there's an accessory navicular, I take that out. And then they call it advancement of the tib post. But in fact, what happens is the tib post attaches to the inferior aspect of the navicular. And so it's not that it's advanced, it's, it's, it's more that it's lifted up and pulled medially. So it's medialization of the tib post, medialization and distalization. So it's, it's, it, I take off the accessory navicular and then put the tib post back where it should be. Um, and if obviously you're sacrificing the tib post, you use a tendon transfer at that point. Um, so that's a long winded answer, but I hope that that sort of explains um, my approach to adults with flat feet. Excellent discussion. Uh, Amy? Oh, I, I find this to be so fascinating and I appreciated your talk. I'm research faculty and focus on foot and ankle. And I have curiosities about the underlying bony morphology. And if you could speak to the variation that you noted and how that may drive predisposition for flat foot development or not, what are your thoughts on the anterior and middle facets and that variation there Do, could that be a, a predisposing morphometric uh presentation yeah very much so 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 weirdly enough I, i've got in my mind my thinking of what's a stable and unstable configuration but um if you open up cesar's paper the one i said on the peritoneal stability and you look at all of the flat feet and they're not it blows your mind because it's no longer affirms to your thing you know there are people in both groups with weird funny shaped Taylor and the talus is the funniest shape of, of, of all bones in the body because you know I, I always had in my mind the ones where you had the two facets separated with a gap in between as being potentially unstable because the head could fall down but that's not the case because you find some people that have got incredible stability with that so I think it's a combination um well, I think your point about the morphology is really interesting. And that's one of my areas, real interest. I'd love to work with you on, on trying to find an answer to that because Evan's work, as I said, was on the basis that he, he felt that there was a morphological abnormality. Your, te your lateral column was short, but I haven't seen that. I've done loads of CT scans. We've taken them out. We've measured them. We've done it. We can't find that they're short. Um, and so, and so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I think, Probably, definitely in cavus feet and people that are born with congenital deformity, they, there is a morphological abnormality. We know that some people have one unifacetal subtalar joint. So they only have one joint that goes from the posterior all the way to the front. Um, and I can't explain that, but I've got a few patients that I've done ankle replacements on that have got that. And um, those patients are very susceptible to ankle ligament sprains, very susceptible to recurrent ankle sprains. And hence ankle OA, but it's the subtalar joint that caused it. So um, I suppose to answer your question, that realistically, the only real way we'd be able to do it would be to do um, CT scans of kids with flat feet and adults with flat feet and take them all out and start measuring and creating a database of them and correlating clinical findings, clinical impression with morphological findings. No one's done that. Um, I would love to do that. I would really love to do that because I think it's a it's a, a part of the answer to this enigma. Excellent. We should talk more. Thank you for that great discussion. <laughs> uh, one of the residents has a question in the chat. Do you ever do the gastroc release with an arthroresis in pediatric patients? So, so that's back to my point before, which is um, when I started to do it, I, I went through this in my mind. They've got really tight gastroc. Shall I do a release or shall I not? And in discussion with the mother, I didn't do the gastroc release. And I was so pleased that I didn't because um, the reason they can't stretch their gastrocs is what I said before, which is that they're not stretching it, basically. It's not because they can't. It's they're not stretching it because all the motions are in the flat foot. So 
Um, so no, I, I think now I've changed the technique and we supinate the foot and fix it. And then people do the gastro stretches. So we do that preoperatively as well, just so they know what they're getting. But I just think the arthroresis does that same, achieves the same thing. It just gives them tailor neutral position. So no, I, I, um, invariably I don't do a gastro in a kid because they're stretchy and they, they've got the opportunity of stretching up. Um, they just need that opportunity to stretch up. So no, I don't tend to do it, but um, you know, you it's certainly an option to do. And one of our senior residents, uh, Pat Kellum has a question. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us, Dr. Goldberg. In calcaneal fractures, I, I liked your description of kind of the hinge joint, but there's a theory or a camp in, in the United States of largely ignoring the middle and anterior facet. Do you think we're uh, not focusing enough in calcaneal fractures on that in kind of the hinge joint on just focusing on the posterior facet? Uh, yeah, very much so. I mean, you know, the, um, you just need the, the good cohort of patients to look at that in is people that have been fused, had an ankle fusion in varus. Um, and what happens in people that have had an ankle fusion fused in varus, invariably, when you see them back after a few years, they've got medial pain. And it's, 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 it's medial pain that's under the medial malleolus. And what you find is the... Um, subtalar joint starts to sublux and you get impingement of the sustentaculum with the medial malleolus, which it shouldn't do normally. Um, so um, I think, as I said, that they are very much related. And I think the, the, the middle facet is a really important one. I suppose the only saving grace for calcaneal fractures is that invariably that's the part that's stable because it's so stable. Um, the, 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 you know, it's the constant fragment, isn't it? The, the sustentaculum is the part that always seems to be in the right place. So I think that's why people don't worry so much about the sustentaculum, but um, uh, uh, yeah, that, that you certainly can get problems with that. But um, it's very difficult with calcaneal fractures because um, uh, you know we still don't know whether or not we alter someone's prognosis by operating or not. Um, we think we do, um, uh, uh, but yeah, I, I do think it's important. It's just it's a challenge, a, very, a big challenge to access it, obviously. But yeah, if, if I had, if you have a choice, then yeah, I would certainly worry about it. Well, on behalf of the whole Department of Orthopedics at the University of Utah, we want to thank you for taking the time today to help us understand this enigma. And perhaps it'll lead to further work between our centers. Amy Lenz, who asked the second to last question, is leading an effort to understand the subtalar joint using other methodologies. And perhaps that will um, help all of us figure out how this actually works. Thank you so much for being part of this today, Andy. I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me and for hosting me. And, and uh, um, um, it, it's, it's weird talking to people with masks on remotely. In, in when we watch soccer in the UK, um, now we're totally televised so everyone's watching the lips of the managers and the players at all stages you cannot talk to each other so the players tend to walk around talking like this on the pitch so that no one knows what they've just said um uh, it's a bit like that trying to talk through a webinar but uh, uh, uh um thank you so much for having me guys <laughs>